Hey everyone, let's get started. Welcome back. I'd like to introduce the co-moderator today, Barry Weintraub. Our first speaker this morning will be discussing evidentiary requirements for standing in courts and administrative agencies. Uh, Adam Dresdick is from, he's the counsel for the Environmental Law Center. Adam? Oh, thank you, good morning. How's the volume at the back there? Good, am I shouting you down at the front here? <laughs> okay, well, uh, thanks for having the Environmental Law Center here today. Uh, I'll start with a bit about our organization before jumping into the topic. Uh, we're a charity. Uh, we're, uh, we're operating in Alberta and uh, we've been doing so since 1982. Uh, we provide public information and education services on environmental and natural resource law topics. Uh, and we do analysis and advocacy for uh, law reform. So the implication of that is I tend to come at this morning's topic from uh, an access to justice perspective, uh, specifically uh, on behalf of, of uh, public interest environmental organizations. Uh, but it's a lively topic and uh, I'm very open to, to hearing some, uh, some competing views on it. Uh, there's two chances to hear us today. Uh, this afternoon, our executive director, Josephine Yam, uh, will be speaking on judicial notice uh, of climate change. So uh, we're grateful for the opportunity to, uh, to form a relationship with this symposium. So uh, really what I want to do is pick up on some themes that uh, I heard on the webinar uh, yesterday. Uh, one of them is the challenges around proofs and causation uh, of environmental harms uh, and uh, and human health issues uh, related to, uh, to environmental impacts. I and the second one uh, is really the, uh, the need to include uh, administrative tribunals uh, in a discussion uh, of environmental hearings. But what I'd like to do is take a step backwards uh, and look at the issue of standing, which is basically the ability to receive a hearing uh, and is often necessary to, to trigger a hearing uh, into existence in courts and sometimes at administrative agencies as well. Uh, this issue has gone from fairly dry uh, and overlooked to being uh, very litigious uh, and very politicized in a short period of time, really within the past, uh, past decade or so, uh, specifically concerning standing at administrative agencies. Um, our organization has just produced a, a fairly comprehensive report on standing in environmental matters. It's available uh, on our website uh, on the slide, www.elc.ab.ca. Uh, and this report uh, is something we're fairly excited about because uh, it may be uh, uh, the largest uh, effort to consolidate uh, cases and commentary on standing uh, in the last 20 years. And it might be the first to specifically tackle uh, the issue of standing in environmental matters. Uh, so for the litigators, uh, there's lots of, uh, lots of cases there in identification of the unsettled issues. For the academic community, uh, it flags some areas where future research is needed. Uh, and for uh, the policymakers, there are legislative reform recommendations in there. So please check it out. There's also a paper for uh, this particular session today, which I'm thrilled that some people have already read. Uh, but uh, don't feel that you have to take too many notes because my presentation is going to follow uh, that paper to the best of my ability. And it's more focused uh, on the evidentiary issues with standing. So I'll start with some background. What, what's the sort of context uh, in which these issues uh, arise? Uh, standing is really a, an issue in public law matters in the common law uh, jurisdictions. Not so much an issue in private law matters, not so much an issue in prosecutions uh, brought by uh, the Attorney General. It's really an issue where citizens uh, or public interest uh, representatives uh, attempt, to, uh, attempt to get a hearing uh, to represent public interest or enforce public rights. Um, and I see that the real issue is that the historical test of standing, we're very based on, on uh, 
individuals' enforceable legal rights. So uh, that creates some barrier uh, in environmental matters because the, the interests at stake are often collectively held and uh, the impacts on those interests uh, are often indirect. Uh, the second issue I see is that the traditional tests for standing were developed by the common law courts in the adversarial litigation context uh, so they can be uh, of questionable merit for use uh, at administrative tribunals uh, with very different mandates. And the third issue I see uh, is that evidence has not been treated uh, as its own topic uh, in a review uh, of standing in the past. But most of the focus has been on questions of law, the semantic legal test. But obviously facts are very important to uh, establishing interest uh, and effects uh, on those interests th that would warrant uh, someone's participation. So uh, I've uh, basically undertaken uh, the task of trying to flag what I feel the uh, the evidentiary issues will be. And in some cases, these issues can be larger than the evidentiary issues with establishing the actual uh, merits of the substantive claims that are at issue in a proceeding. So let's have a look here, backwards, forwards. What must be proven uh, in a standing uh, situation uh, is contentious because uh, the tests are often vague uh, and provide very little guidance to decision makers. For example, if someone has to be directly affected or adversely affected or aggrieved or suffer some prejudice, uh, these tests have been called by the academic commentators a semantic wasteland. Uh, <laughs> there is some jurisprudence that picks up on that commentary uh, that's cited in the report. Uh, so th these tests might even apply some need for causation uh, of impacts uh, simply uh, to trigger a hearing. Second issue, burden of proof. The, the onus of proving standing is on the plaintiff or, or the person seeking standing. This is settled law, uh, but is not uncontentious. Uh, numerous law reform uh, commissions ha have recommended a presumption of standing where, where people would, would have standing, but then that could be challenged or rebutted based on specific reasons why they shouldn't. Uh, and the value of that is it could shift the focus to the actual substantive issues uh, th that are to be heard uh, and decided, uh, and, and then the right people uh, to involve would be based on, on what issues are at stake. Uh, the second uh, merit of that is that it could um, uh, allow refusals of standing to be based on real factual circumstances uh, instead of hypothetical ones. Uh, many of the rationales uh, against standing are concerns with opening the floodgates uh, to excessive litigation, uh, allowing busybodies uh, with no stake in the issues to litigate. Uh, the, the, the value uh, of, uh, of a rebuttal presumption is that then one could look at does this person uh, you know, are they themselves vexatious? Would they cause undue delay uh, as opposed to, to relying on, uh, on theory? Uh, now, the standard of proof is distinguishable from the burden of proof. Uh, the standard of proof in, in determining standing is usually lower than the civil standard of a balance of probabilities. Sometimes it's articulated as only requiring a prima facie case. Uh, that really leads us to the final issue, which is whether standing should be determined at the outset separate from uh, the merits of the substantive claims. There's no rule that it must be, uh, but it is common practice. Uh, the, the tension is between the efficiency of those preliminary determinations uh, and the risk of dismissing meritorious claims without having all the evidence available. Uh, courts vary on their adherence to this practice Tribunals uh, are often more committed to preliminary determinations, uh, but when we get in the case law, we'll see that the standing tests uh, can create some challenges in adhering to that model. So, standing in courts versus standing in tribunals. How much the same, how much different? 
Uh, let's start with the courts. The, the starting point I would see with the courts is that courts have inherent jurisdiction to hear issues that are suitable for judicial determination. So uh, determining standing is apt to merge questions of law in the sense that there'll be a legal test, questions of fact, uh, and questions of judicial policy. Um, so there's really two, two big principles to grasp. The first one is a historic common law public nuisance rule. Uh, and this is basically that the attorney general is the right person to enforce public rights uh, or perhaps someone with the consent of the attorney general. A private citizen can only enforce public rights if their own private rights have been uh, infringed on at the same time or they suffer some kind of special damage that's different from that suffered by the general public. This creates a significant issue with what must be proven. Uh, does it have to be different in kind, a different type of damage, or does it only have to be different in degree? I've been hurt more uh, th than you and everybody else. Um, so, so again, the semantic wasteland. Uh, this rule, despite being heavily criticized, does persist today uh, in various forms, even though the uh, Court decisions do not always articulate it consistently. It is uh, in play. Um, and if the Attorney General chooses not to prosecute and cho or chooses to stay a citizen prosecution, uh, those decisions uh, uh, cannot be challenged. Second uh, principle is public interest standing. Uh, this is a late 20th century Canadian development. Uh, it's very significant. Uh, as a political development in Western democracies. Uh, and basically, it's a discretionary form of standing uh, granted to uphold uh, the role of the courts. So there's really three factors to consider. Uh, and the first is the issue. Public interest standing is only granted for, uh, at this point in time, for a narrow range of legal issues. The two that have been recognized are constitutional challenges to legislation and uh, challenges to the legality of administrative action. So that's the real barrier. It's not a, a, a factual barrier. It's a question of law. The, the issue has to fit. If the issue fits, the courts have largely done away with the evidentiary barriers. Uh, the, the second factor they'll consider is whether this person is directly affected or has a genuine interest. Uh, and the lower courts in environmental matters have developed a, a large number of objective indicators of genuine interest, the most important of which are the, uh, the purpose or object of environmental organizations or environmental plaintiffs and uh, their record of involvement in the substantive subject matter or, or the substantive issues. Those are much more important than geographic proximity to environmental impacts or, or prior uh, involvement in the legal dispute. Uh, so very, very low uh, evidentiary requirements. The final factor that the courts will look at is, is whether this person provides an appropriate means for the issues to be heard. Uh, this is a very low barrier in environmental matters because usually no one is more directly affected than uh, the, uh, the environmental plaintiff. It, it has been an enormous barrier uh, in non-environmental matters uh, in the most recent Supreme Court of Jurisprudence uh, Supreme Court of Canada jurisprudence deliberately relaxes uh, this factor uh, in light of that history. I don't think that will be a big game changer uh, in environmental matters. The, the barriers in the courts are more legal uh, than evidentiary uh, in a public interest standing case. Tribunals. Uh, this is where the issue is most contentious uh, and I would see a different starting point for the analysis in that tribunals are not courts. Uh, what matters to me uh, is that most tribunal proceedings are not litigation in the sense that there is not a lease or a legal dispute directly between the parties. Quite frequently, there are further interests at stake, public interest. Second difference I see is that many tribunal proceedings are forward-looking in the sense that they uh, look at potential impacts on these interests in the future as opposed to trying to establish the facts of past events. And the implication of that is that tribunal proceedings uh, are more apt to allow for a range of reasonable outcomes uh, as opposed to requiring uh, a yes-no legal decision uh, 
siding with the claim of one party against the other. Uh, second difference I see is that tribunal mandates need to come from ordinary legislation. Uh, they have no inherent jurisdiction to hear issues uh, or determine standing. And these mandates vary immensely uh, as far as the issues that should be heard uh, in the standing regimes. It could be anything from open standing to only hearing from categorized rights holders. It could be anything from, fr from uh, soliciting public views on policy to uh, uh, adjudicating uh, private disputes. So the diversity uh, is enormous and presumably the standing regime should fit those mandates, although it all may not happen that way. So lots of litigation. I've selected a, a select number of cases that I feel highlight this issue of indirect interest, indirect effect. A and to do so, I picked a bunch of cases that concern air emissions uh, across Canada uh, so that we can look for some trends. Don't feel the need to write this down and I'll just touch on in brief what, what I see coming out uh, of the various jurisdictions. Th these Alberta cases at the top are ones where uh, the courts have overturned tribunal decisions uh, to deny standing in the first two Kelly cases and overturn tribunal decision to deny costs in, in the third. So uh, an intervening court in the first case finding no need to be differently affected than the general public under a test requiring that one be directly affected. So more relaxed than common law public nuisance rule, uh, although they may not state it as such. Second case, uh, courts concerned with um, really high evidentiary uh, standards um, as far as having to prove uh, impacts uh, on personal uh, health problems caused by uh, industrial air emissions. Uh, court saying that the question is simply, may someone be affected, lo looking more at the existence of risk. And in the final Kelly case, the, the court uh, laying down some dictum that uh, tribunals differ from courts in that the proceedings are not fully adversarial and uh, regulatory interventions uh, serve a, a more inherent purpose uh, in serving the regulatory process. Second uh, Alberta litigation concerning the appeals board, uh, again, court overturning uh, a denial of standing by the tribunal, emphasizing uh, that standing uh, should be determined as a preliminary matter on uh, low uh, standards of proof. In this case, the tribunal had determined standing at the very end of the substantive proceedings along with the merits uh, of the claims. Um, the result of this is that standing was denied at the very end after the tribunal had already heard and recognized uh, issues uh, with uh, the, the industrial approval in question. British Columbia, very recent case here. Uh, I would encourage the core practitioners to check out Gange versus Sharp because it gives and takes away. Uh, <coughs> the court overturns a denial of standing on numerous grounds, concerns with procedural fairness, uh, concerns with high evidentiary standards suggesting court says there should only need to be a prima facie case, uh, and concerns with the tribunal imposing requirements on incorporated groups, incorporated organizations that the individual members be directly affected, uh, not required the organizations are legal persons. They can try to get standing, although the court admits that under the legislated test, they may face a difficulty, which is where the case takes away. Uh, the same case provides some obiter that is very unreceptive to uh, common law public interest standing at this tribunal where the legislature has prescribed uh, a more restrictive test. Ontario, altogether uh, entirely different type of decision concerning uh, the Ontario Environmental Review Tribunal in that the, tri the court upholds a tribunal decision to grant standing. Uh, this is an extremely informative case in that it illustrates the difference between standing and the substantive claims because the Ontario legislation that was alluded to by, by the presenters uh, on causation of proofs yesterday is a bill of rights 
uh, and it provides a two-part test. The interest requirement for standing is very low and community and environmental groups can successfully pass that. Then the person must seek leave to appeal on the substantive issues. The court says this is stringent, uh, fully admits that the legislature has set a stringent test. One must prove that uh, there is uh, a decision that's potentially unreasonable uh, to be challenged and they must prove that there is a potential risk of substantial environmental harm. Uh, but in this case, uh, there was a prima facie case uh, and the decision to grant standing was upheld. I find this striking as an outsider looking at this regime, given that's an environmental bill of rights, because having to establish that a decision is unreasonable, to me that would typically be the substantive finding of a judicial review uh, decision. And having to find that a decision might cause significant environmental harm that would typically be the finding of uh, an environmental assessment review. So, so again, uh, requirements, evidentiary requirements for standing that, that look almost like uh, having to establish the merits uh, of substantive claims. Um, some evidence uh, in the Ontario case that uh, is relevant in that it was also mentioned yesterday uh, is uh, these policy statements of environmental values uh, were used uh, in this particular case uh, as evidence uh, of, uh, of significant environmental harm. It was, uh, that evidence of harm w would not rest on simply the fact that an approval complies with uh, the regulatory requirements. The tribunal can look beyond that uh, at environmental policies. So flag that for uh, potential points of evidence. So what trends do we see here? What, what's going to come out uh, across the country and perhaps going forward? Well, well, the first trend is there's no cohesive jurisprudence. None of these cases cite each other or provide uh, a principled uh, authority on standing at environmental tribunals. The courts have all been very narrowly focused uh, on the tribunal in question and the legislation mandating that tribunal. But the second point is courts are showing uh, an inclination to allow the legislature to set tests for standing. Whether tribunals can grant common law public interest standing the way that courts do uh, is an unsettled issue. Uh, our paper for the conference cites a number of uh, further uh, commentaries and cases on that issue that remains out in the field. Uh, but what the courts are, have been fairly unfavorable to this idea. Uh, but what they are willing to do is intervene where tribunals are creating legislative or evidentiary barriers that exceed those that are clearly required by legislation. And on the flip side, uh, the courts have shown willingness to uphold tribunal grants of standing even though those evidentiary hurdles may appear stringent. And our report on standing, which covers uh, an immense uh, amount of case law, was unable to locate uh, a case in the environmental realm where a court has overturned uh, a tribunal decision to grant standing uh, regardless uh, of what the test for standing might be. Third trend is that these cases are showing an increase towards judicial policy considerations in decisions on standing at tribunals. So recall at the beginning, common law standing, question of law policy, uh, law fact and judicial policy. Standing at tribunals, different question because the legislature sets the policy so it could simply be called a question of law and fact. Yet, if one goes back to these cases, um, we see judicial policy considerations. Concern in Gange with access to justice uh, and tribunals exercising their mandate in a cautious manner. Uh, concern in Gange with fairness. Uh, concern in the Kelly cases with the role of tribunals. Uh, concern in the court case with the participatory nature of legislation. Um, so again, uh, the, the uh, 
courts are beginning to infuse uh, the cases that exist with their own policy considerations, um, that may be a trend to continue. So what about these legislated tests? The trend that I see with these historic tests that require one to be adversely affected or aggrieved, uh, across the board, even though these tests vary semantically uh, in these different cases, the tribunals and the courts are clearly struggling to articulate what must be proven. Um, th there is no contest that the burden of proof falls on the plaintiff or the regulatory intervener, uh, and that burden uh, is quite significant. Uh, the tribunals are, are struggling to maintain a low standard of proof for preliminary determinations, uh, and in some cases they are struggling uh, to uh, adhere to the practice of preliminary determinations uh, of standing. Um, so uh, again, uh, these tests, regardless of how they're articulated, create some very similar issues, uh, all that tend to gravitate around some merger between standing uh, and the substantive uh, issues or substantive claims uh, that are to be proven. Uh, a real throwback or vestige from the historic common law model that persists today in environmental regulatory matters. So in conclusion, uh, issues uh, at courts, issues at tribunals are somewhat similar uh, despite some different mandates uh, between these agencies. In the tribunal context, uh, this is likely uh, a legislative reform issue uh, or at least a check on the existing legislation to ensure that uh, the standing regime uh, serves the mandate of those tribunals and the issues uh, th that they are supposed to be deciding. Uh, our findings is that the courts are ahead uh, on a more functional uh, approach to standing and public interest matters. And a big part of that is that the evidentiary barriers uh, have been significantly lowered. Uh, the, the question is really whether the legal issues uh, are those that are appropriate for determination. Uh, in the tribunal context, the litigation, I expect, will continue to increase uh, in the absence of reforms and perhaps even because of them. Uh, I would see a chance here to create some cohesive jurisprudence uh, around standing at tribunals. If the practitioners would take notice of the uh, parallel developments in multiple uh, jurisdictions, uh, the door is open uh, to move toward the more principled jurisprudence of uh, standing at tribunals, and if our materials can help, then, uh, th then we offer them to you. So 15 minutes left, 10, 10 minutes to 15 minutes for discussion and comments. Uh, looking forward to hearing from the audience. Thank you, Adam. Again, as with yesterday, if you can write your questions on cards, then we can uh, share that with the folks online. Do you have any questions? I could prime the audience with some questions, but I think we should see what comes out. Well, while they're thinking, why don't you prime them with one? Um, Adam, actually, I had a question. Um, oh. and, and the question is um, whether there really is a huge difference between the um, issues that would um, determine standing in a court or in a tribunal. Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, because on one hand, courts can tackle some broader policy issues as long as there is at the core a, a justiciable issue. In other words, a legal issue that is suitable for determination by that court. W one of the largest contests in the public interest standing cases I is with political questions. When should the courts enter into uh, the policy realm uh, or, or not? Likewise, at tribunals, those mandates vary immensely. Some tribunals are clearly grappling with policy issues. Some tribunals uh, uh, are there to adjudicate disputes, much, much in the matter of courts. So, so I do see so, some overlap. Uh, further on the tribunal side, uh, I believe the tribunals are, are under pressure to distinguish uh, policy decisions from regulatory decisions and, and set the scope of what should be included 
uh, in a tribunal hearing. Um, so, so I do see some overlap there, Barry. Uh, the core issue that, that I would gravitate towards is the absence of a lease. Uh, in other words, the absence of a litigation dispute directly between the parties uh, to a tribunal proceeding, especially at tribunals that are regulatory boards that make original decisions. Uh, perhaps at an appeals tribunal, it might be more court-like. Uh, but uh, I, I do see a difference there as far as tribunals being forward-looking uh, as opposed to, to backwards-looking. Uh, the, the Alberta Law Reform Institute it, it was adamant uh, in their recommendations uh, about stating that tribunals are not courts. Uh, but from a practitioner's perspective, perhaps may, may much of the... Uh, M much of the procedure and trappings uh, and reliance on parties and evidence uh, will be very similar. I, I think that's a great question. Further Thank you. That one? We yes. have a second question. You suggested you'd identified areas for further research. Is it the question of standing before tribunals? Most of the questions I see for further research do concern the question of standing before tribunals because this is the area that's been underlooked uh, and is becoming politicized and litigious very quickly. So uh, I'll list three in that area. First uh, is the need to establish some empirical evidence uh, around the actual impacts of different standing regimes on the policy rationales for and against standing. Many of the rationales against standing, as I alluded to, are concerns with agencies becoming swamped, uh, consuming uh, judicial resources, uh, or with parties not having a, a legitimate stake in the proceedings. Most of the law reform uh, reports debunk uh, these arguments. Th there are simply too many uh, practical barriers to litigation uh, and to uh, appearing at tribunals. Costs, uh, social stigmatization, uh, lack of capacity, people have better things to do, uh, re legal interventions are not a focus for many environmental advocates, their, their energies go to other types uh, of activities. So what's missing uh, that I see is some numbers. Well, let's compare some different types of standing and look at what's the clearance rate of these courts and tribunals? Are, are they moving files through quickly? Uh, like for example, the Envi Land and Environmental Court of New, New South Wales has open standing for some matters, yet only a couple out of thousands of matters a year are brought under this regime. The court clears files at a faster rate than new matters are filed. So, so broad standing is not contributing to inefficiency. Perhaps in another tribunal it is. We need some evidence. What is perhaps even more lacking is evidence of the positive impacts of uh, standing. Uh, for example, does it contribute to the substantive environmental decisions? There are some studies on interveners, in other words, third persons who, who uh, participate in proceedings having an influence on uh, the outcome of public interest litigation in court. I see a great opportunity for similar studies uh, on, on uh, interventions and standing in the tribunal context are these people contributing to better environmental decisions? Because that, that, that's the, the one of the rationales for, for involving people, the other being fairness and access to justice. Third uh, study I see is the need for a study on regulatory culture or judicial culture. Because when the tests are vague, it's quite possible that uh, findings that the tests are met, findings that there's sufficient facts uh, to warrant standing are actually driven by latent judicial receptivity to public interest representation or, or latent receptivity at the tribunal to triggering hearings <coughs> and hearing from uh, environmental representatives. This is an acute issue in the tribunal context because the uh, decision documents are, are often very sparse. Tribunal determinations of standing can be made on paper submissions uh, with very little affidavit evidence. Uh, 
the rules of evidence don't apply, the tribunal may simply issue a letter to the parties uh, stating that they don't have standing. There might be no pre-hearing co conference. There might be no hearing on standing to contest uh, evidence for and against standing. So the, the reasons for decisions on standing at tribunals are not as clear. I see a role for researchers to develop trust with regulatory agencies, trust with the courts, uh, and produce some understanding of the institutional culture in which decisions on standing uh, are rendered. Uh, so, so that's three. Uh, maybe we should hear from another uh, question, and if researchers want to engage the Environmental Law Center, we can work with you in scoping those. Our next um, question. Okay, we, we have another question um, from one of our viewers on, on the internet. Hi, great presentation. Um, given that tribunals are often dealing with regulation of monopolies as a substitute for market forces or the allocation of access to public resources, and Canada explicitly does not have a constitutional right to private property, should we radically limit challenges to standing for public interest participants? This is a great question uh, because th there's really two sides to it. Well, one, there's no constitutional protection for, for property rights in many cases, and, and the other is that there's no constitutional protection for the environment, um, which is a particular issue uh, in that even though property rights may, may seem uh, at risk, if you want to get standing or participate in a hearing, uh, the best thing you can have is property rights or economic interests because you can prove you're directly affected. Uh, the barriers to representing public interests are, are enormous. I would say that one of the traditional uh, arguments against standing that has significant relevance uh, in the regulatory context uh, is that there's concern with harms to the interests of third parties. Uh, that is a, a factor to consider. Um, the rationale is that the most directly affected parties, such as the economic players that are subject to a regulatory decision, or the landowners who, who are impacted by a, a, a oil and gas well approval, should be allowed to, to settle their private matters as they see fit. Uh, as a practical matter, uh, the private parties who are impacted may, may face disincentives uh, to regulatory intervention uh, or, or litigation. They may rely on public interest organizations uh, to raise uh, the concerns. Um, and uh, the second issue is that the regulatory uh, agencies, in theory, do not exist uh, to serve uh, simply the interests of uh, the industrial proponents. E even if the government policy context uh, directs the agencies to promote development of the industry, th there's still further public interest at stake. So in a sense, the argument that uh, th there should be limits on public interest representation in order to protect the interests uh, of uh, third parties with property rights and economic rights uh, is weaker in the regulatory context, in the tribunal context, or at least it looks differently <coughs> in the sense that those concerns with private rights are, are more uh, political policy concerns rather than judicial policy concerns or, or tribunal policy concerns. But th that's just a fabulous question to the extent that the, the, the asker has nailed uh, the two sometimes competing areas of interest, neither of which uh, benefit from the level of constitutional protection that many of us would like to see. Thank you. Let, let's talk about this on a, on a practical level. And you mentioned access to justice. Uh, and I guess the question that occurs to me is access to justice for whom? Take a situation with a, a renewable energy project where you have some residents in the neighborhood who are wanting to um, challenge it. And you have an environmental group that may have an interest in supporting all of the um, renewable energy projects um, from, from the point of view of, of the environment. If you allow broad standing and allow people to come in and allow the, the uh, proponents of renewable energy to come in, 
shouldn't you, in fairness, allow the, oppo the opponents of it or the um, proponents of alternatives, such as the traditional um, methods, to come in as well? Then what you end up with is a much longer, much more expensive hearing for all concerned. And so from a practical standpoint of how expensive justice is, does um, enhanced standing necessarily increase access to justice? Well, this is a fabulous question. Uh, because of the competing interests at stake, uh, I see the initial interest as what's the scope uh, of that regulatory hearing? Uh, are, are we looking at the, the policy in favor of wind development versus uh, you, you know, favoring conventional energy sources, or, or are we looking at the regulatory requirements uh, of this oil and gas well or this windmill? And, and I think that's where uh, the, the problem starts, and that's why we get down this road of debating who should be heard and what their interests are, as opposed to what issues we're here to decide. I think the tension between environmental groups and locally affected people uh, can work both ways because in some cases the locally affected people will be in favor of a project or at least they would like to see it go ahead if their quality of life concerns were addressed whereas a big environmental group may be opposed to the industry wholesale. In the other case as you alluded to the local people may be uh, opposed to the impacts on their lives yet the environmental groups favor that environmental source. This is what I would call an environmental justice problem in the sense that the environmental justice perspective w would suggest that people uh, are disproportionately impacted. The people who live there bear the disproportionate impacts uh, of decisions on how public resources should be developed. Quite frequently, those people also suffer other grounds of disadvantage, such as uh, economic disadvantage, they may break down uh, along racial uh, lines, uh, national lines, uh, and, and such. So there is a misfit between the environmental justice argument and the conventional uh, mainstream uh, environmental arguments. Uh, the second issue you raised is big hearings cause delay. Yeah, this, this is one of the main ways in which the issue of standing at tribunals and the issue of standing at courts uh, is similar in, in that you cast a big net, uh, it, it does uh, have an, an impact. Uh, now, delay in large hearings uh, can potentially be addressed through process management uh, as opposed to standing. S standing uh, establishes who the parties are, there are countless other mechanisms within the clear jurisdiction of tribunals to stream concerns, to, to hear oral written representations, to require that submissions be relevant, uh, to, to pool claims and such. So it might be a process management issue. The second delay issue that I'll flag, and this affects the previous speaker's comment as well, is most of the contentious standing cases in, in which they get bogged down in, in appeals and, and court proceedings concern private interest players, landowners, uh, industry competitors, trade competitors, uh, other uh, industrial players or, or, or economic actors whose interests are affected. Uh, this would go back to the empirical research question uh, of, of the effect of standing. If most of the delay is in fact caused by people with private interests, these people can't be screened out with narrow standing tests anyway so, so uh, my uh, preference would be go abroad. But again, uh, as I alluded to at the start, uh, we're coming from an access to justice for public interest representation perspective. And it is, as Barry has mentioned, a live issue with competing access to justice. Adam, two final questions, a couple of minutes. First one, in my jurisdiction, the same parties show up at almost every tribunal hearing, just changing their name to in quotations, concerned citizens for fill in the blank, yeah. <laughs> yeah. or yeah. friends of fill in the blank. Yeah. Should there be some way to control these professional interveners who make a business of securing participant funding? Yeah, th these are just superb questions. The, the people against everything uh, comes up <laughs> in uh, the numerous contexts, municipal development, in, in fact, th this is a larger issue in the municipal context, 
than it is uh, in the uh, environmental regulatory context, although we've been advised repeatedly that the same landowners will attempt to intervene on every routine uh, gas well hearing, uh, or every routine. Sh should there be controls? Absolutely. Uh, the whole purpose of standing is to, um, is, is to establish a, an appropriate connection uh, be, between the, the parties and the issues. Uh, and th there's no shortage uh, of ways to screen out uh, unmeritorious parties, vexatious parties, uh, those who don't have a, a real stake in the issue. Uh, th this is a question of, um, that I see, uh, of whoever's deciding standing uh, doing their job. How, how much discretion do they have to hear from people and if they have discretion to hear from that person and uh, if they decide that, that they want to hear from that person, that, that, that's within their jurisdiction. If they're required to hear from that person by right, um, again, the tribunal is doing their job uh, and it's the job of the standing tests that those tribunals are prescribed to set those limits. Um, th th this is a concern with repeat interveners Professional interveners uh, and the existence uh, of, of perceived professional interveners uh, is often raised as an argument uh, against standing. But the flip side is, is that a professional intervener may be able to make a more substantive contribution to a proceeding if they have the capacity to, to speak to the issues and conduct responsible proceedings. Uh, then there may be a procedural efficiency benefit to that person. I, I've never ever heard anybody suggest that the cost regimes or participant funding regimes uh, at, at tribunals in Canada would allow anyone to make a living. Uh, they bar bar barely allow the interveners to participate in a helpful, meaningful way. Uh, uh, th most of the law reform recommendations that we've heard to date would suggest package efficiency measures and access to justice measures together and those access to justice measures should include standing and a funding regime that would allow those persons who do have standing to actually uh, participate in a manner that's beneficial to the proceeding. And our final question, thank you. Do you see public interest standing becoming more vital as we see government interveners retreating, in quotations, from the public interest slash scientific expert space for example, Fisheries and Oceans Canada no longer conducting their own regional studies or scientific inquiries. Definitely. We've seen this in Alberta. If one looks at regulatory hearings, say from the 1980s to now, hearings in the old days were more fulsome in my view in the sense that many government agencies other than the, the board or tribunal making the decision would be more apt to appear uh, and make substantive submissions. Uh, I see a practical reality w where it, governments cannot represent all the public interest at stake. There are simply too many uh, financial constraints, too many political constraints, too many uh, bureaucratic constraints uh, as to whose responsibility uh, it is. Uh, so, so I do see a role, uh, and so do most of the law reform recommendations, for, for non-government representation of public interest. Now, mo lots of the, the, the move to downsize hearings and to eliminate public interest representation is of course to, to uh, eliminate delay, to, to create efficient process, to create certainty uh, in regulatory process. Uh, if these decisions are on standing are simply being challenged, uh, and if there wasn't fulsome public interest representation in the first place, Sometimes it's just creating more issues for disputes. Things move up through the courts. Uh, so I'm not convinced that a downsizing uh, of government involvement ha has had the, uh, the, the practical impact that it was supposed to. It might be better just to, uh, just to deal with the issues up front. Uh, and and, and if, that's, if that's the tack, then yes, there's definitely a role uh, for non-government players. Thank you, Adam, for I think a very interesting discussion. Thank you. And that, that last question was a perfect lead in to our next speaker. The issue of how do you get expert evidence before a tribunal um, is what our next speaker, Asha James, is going to talk about.
Asha is uh, the managing associate of Faulkner's LLP in Toronto. Um, she has a, a practice that focuses on human rights cases and on Renewal Energy Act appeals in, in various tribunals, and she also appears in various courts. Come on up, Asha. Um, and please um, keep the questions coming. They're, they're very helpful. If people um, sitting at, at home in the um, warmth of minus 11 Winnipeg or in the um, plus 15 weather in South Quebec, that is Florida, um, feel free to send your questions in um, because it, it's really helpful. Good morning, everyone. And if anybody's having trouble hearing me in the back, just wave your hand. I'm a quiet speaker. Uh, so my practice generally focuses on the area of constitutional law, human rights, and public interest litigation. I am new to the field of environmental law and how our office kind of got into the whole environmental um, aspect and renewable energy approvals was through a constitutional lens. Um, we commenced some appeals in Ontario raising questions about the constitutionality of certain um, provisions under the Environmental Protection Act. So I'm gonna speak today about the challenges of gathering expert evidence for everyday citizens, regular appellants. I think a lot as lawyers, we take a very uh, practical approach. Someone comes into your office, we know how to build a case, we know what you need, um, and then you have an appellant, a litigant, with practical restrictions, which is generally we can't afford <laughs> to uh, man all these experts that are going to be required um, to, to put before an uh, environmental tribunal hearing um, in order to be successful. So I'm going to look at the barriers in um, varying categories. First, I'll, I'll touch on the availability of experts. Um, I'll touch on the timelines uh, in Ontario for appeals of renewable energy projects, uh, the costs of the experts, and then generally how experts are used by lawyers and given these limitations, how they can be used by appellants in these environmental review tribunals. Okay. So the availability of experts. Generally, um, and, and this has been my experience, in, in the field of environmental law, there's not tons of experts out there. I, you know, there's not a Google search that I can go through and find a number of experts who are going to come forward and be able to um, give expert evidence at a tribunal. So you have a very limited pool to start with. Then what happens is that a lot of the experts in the field um, have been retained by uh, renewable energy project approval holders. So they're already, you know, they're conflicted out um, they can't act as an expert for you. So that limits your pool oh, even good. further. And if you want to try to introduce new, fresh evidence that hasn't oh, been before the tribunal before, oh, to try and create an aspect that hasn't been uh, before the tribunal before, um, you have a very uh, a limited pool of experts. So you kind of have to try to think outside of the box. Oh. And one of the things that we've noticed in Ontario um, especially in respect of renewable energy wind projects, is that a lot of the experts in the area are outside of the province of Ontario. There have been a lot of research in the area that has been done in Europe. So you're now left with trying to, you know, you're going into other jurisdictions to look for experts. And that leaves an appellant with the question of, can I fly an expert to Ontario to provide expert evidence? So I have to not only engage the expert to review evidence and provide a report, I have to fly an expert into Ontario from, I mean, Holland, Portugal, <laughs> um, Great Britain, Australia. There, you know, there, there's lots of those types of limitations. Um, then there's going to be the issue of, you know, once you have the expert come to Ontario, how long the expert can, can stay, um, how they can assist you in uh, building your case. One of the problems that, uh, from my perspective, that we've noticed in Ontario is that under the Environmental Protection Act and the regulations, 
an appeal of a re renewable energy project. From the time that the appeal is filed, the tribunal has six months to render a decision. That is a expedited time frame. From the time an appeal is filed, an appellant has five and a half weeks to retain an expert, have an expert review um, all documents and materials that they would be required to provide an expert opinion on and provide an expert report. If you think about waiting until there has been an exchange of documents between the parties, you actually have two and a, two and a half weeks from that time when documents are exchanged by between the parties of all relevant documents in their possession to the time that the expert has to provide their opinion. From the perspective of, of lawyers working with, the, with appellants, that timeline, is, it's almost impossible, really, to get uh, an expert to provide uh, an opinion that's not generic, right? I can go out and I can find an expert who can provide me a generic opinion on generally how some things affect health, uh, generally how certain things um, affect uh, the environment, but to get an expert to focus in on specific issues surrounding a specific project or specific appellants or specific witnesses, it's very difficult to find someone who can meet those timelines. Uh, on top of that, generally what we would do in, in a litigation case is, you know, I would get an expert, if I'm looking at the renewable energy process, I would get an acoustician, and an acoustician would provide me with a report. That acoustician's report, and I would give that to a medical doctor, and I would say, here's what my acoustician has said about um, noise limits, here's what some of the, the research in the field has said, can you take this report and expand upon that in respect of any kind of health impacts that may arise? Well, given the timelines, I, I can't do that, because I can't, I would have to have an acoustician provide me a report within a week after retaining them and then take that report to a medical doctor and ask them to provide me a, with a report within a week after retaining them. And if I want to build on that report, then I would have to find another expert um, and ask them to provide me with a report within a week <laughs> in order to be able to build a proper case. And it becomes either the, the experts say, you're crazy, that, I mean, no one can meet these time limits, or it becomes cost prohibitive because the expert then says, okay, if you want me to meet these timelines, here are the costs. And appellants are then faced with, we can't meet these, either we can't meet these cost requirements, so we're going to have to scale back the quality of the experts that we can call or the number of experts we can call. Or in a lot of uh, situations, they're left with a choice between trying to engage legal counsel or trying to call expert evidence and um, going at a tribunal hearing themselves and trying to use their funds to call those experts. Now, if we look at the, the costs of the experts um, for appellants, generally the appellants, especially in the Ontario um, Renewable Energy Approval Appeals, uh, these appellants are people in rural communities, many of them are farmers, and they are able to pay for counsel and to pay for some of their experts through funding, through uh, community outreach, through having events to have people donate funds so that they can pay for these costs. Now, one of the problems that they run into in respect of these expedited timelines is that you're either gonna have to start your fundraising way before any approval process has been granted so that you have um, funds set aside that if an approval has been granted, you can then commence a case or you have to start engaging experts and, and counsel 
before any approval has ever been granted. Now, it's one thing for a, a proponent. Um, they've worked with experts throughout their, their process in, in getting to the stage of even receiving an approval. But to ask an appellant to fundraise or set aside funds or undertake the cost of engaging an expert when they don't even know if an approval is actually going to be granted is a very difficult position for an appellant to be in. We're saying, go out there, we're gonna find these experts, we're going to give them the material, and we're gonna ask them to get to work. And we're gonna ask you to undertake 10 or $20,000 before you even know if an approval is granted. So what happens if that approval is not granted? What happens if, for whatever reason, the proponent decides they're going to withdraw their application? You now have an appellant who has undertaken or invested ten or $20,000 that they can't recover. Most people are not in a position to do that. So it really limits when you can start the engagement process. Now, one of the other barriers is Generally in litigation, how we use experts, I, I would love to have an expert that when I get productions, I say, hey, look, look at everything that we have here. What are your thoughts on this? And the expert can assist you in going through the productions. They can flag issues for you. The expert can be in court when the other experts testify uh, so they, they understand um, exactly what's being presented before a tribunal. Uh, the experts can assist a lawyer in preparing for cross-examination. In a lot of these environmental review tribunals, uh, the issues before the tribunals are fairly technical. Uh, some of the, um, the issues that, like, let's say some of the things that an acoustician is looking at and discussing uh, the certain um, requirements for modelings of sound, those are things that generally go way over my head and I would, uh, I would guess way over the head of a lot of lawyers. It's just not something that we deal with. So it would be great to have an expert that could sit down and explain to a lawyer all of these technical requirements, how these things work, what are the flaws in um, some of the, uh, the reports that have been put forward by approval holders in the field. But due to the timelines and the costs, involved in this, appellants can't retain experts in that capacity. So you're left with a situation where because of the time and because of the cost, you have a very limited role in which you can use an expert. And to be quite honest, it becomes a very generic exercise. I have an expert who can say generally, this is what happens um, when you have a renewable energy project, I can have an expert that says, okay, this is how I would model the noise from this project, or this is what happens when somebody is deprived of sleep, or this is what happens um, through infrasound generally. But it becomes very difficult to get that expert to tie those issues into a particular project because they don't have the time and the appellants just generally don't have the funds in order to engage the expert in that type of manner. Now, the previous speaker um, raised some issues or concerns regarding access to justice. And from my point of view, the Ontario process for renewable energy pr approvals, the expedited process, really limits the ability of an appellant to fully participate in the process. <coughs> I mean, generally, if you think of a, a, a litigation as a, a lawyer in, in regular litigation stream, you'll have a client who comes to you, um, you, you, know, you file a claim, that sometimes you're waiting 30, 40, 60 days to even get a defense. Then you have the, the exchange of productions. That can take months. Um, 
then once you have that, you can start um, retaining experts. Within the Ontario process, from the time the appeal is filed, uh, like I've said, there is five and a half weeks in order to get an expert report put together. So five and a half weeks to go out and find an expert, to um, educate the expert on the issues that are in play, to have that expert review all of your material, to have that expert write a report, and to provide that report to the other side. I, I think that the time limits um, are, they're quite incredible as far as I'm concerned and they make it very difficult for any appellant to really have a meaningful ability to participate in the process. Now, we have had a push in um, Canadian litigation uh, around what it means to have access to justice. And there was a recent report that was put out by Justice Cromwell entitled Access to Civil and Family Justice. And that report calls for a culture shift on the way courts approach access to justice systems. And one of the things that the report focuses on is that we have to have a focus on the people who need to use the system. The focus must include all people, especially members of immigrant, aboriginal, and rural populations, and other vulnerable groups. Litigants, and particularly self-represented litigants, are not, as they are too often seen, an inconvenience. They are why the system exists. So in Ontario, when you have a renewable energy project, Anybody in the province of Ontario can commence an appeal in respect of that project. But the grounds of appeal are limited. So you can only be successful in having a uh, renewable energy approval revoked if the appellant can show that the project will cause serious harm to human health or serious and irreversible harm to plant and animal life. So it's a very narrow focused tribunal, very narrow focused appeal, but the term serious harm to human health is fairly broad and how you build on that is only through experts. The Ontario <laughs> Review Tribunal has said that you can't be successful at this tribunal, you can't meet this standard without calling an expert. So we know then that in order, if you're going to bring an appeal, in order to be successful, you have to have an expert. And if you can't afford to have the experts necessary to meet the requirements, then it's not, it's not a process in which an appellant can mean meaningfully participate. You're limited. You're limited by time and you're limited by expense. And therefore, it in many people's mind, it, it makes the process a, a rubber stamp for approvals. Someone brings an appeal and they are, um, because of the time limits and the expense, almost excluded from really meaningfully participating in the process, and it makes the, um, the process seem as though it's just a rubber stamp for the approval. So I think as lawyers dealing with appellants and dealing with the um, ability to retain experts in this type of expedited process, it really requires you to think outside of the box. Um, it really requires you to uh, pretty much have a list of experts that one could use. It requires you to, um, you know, go outside of your general jurisdictional area. It requires you to be in constant contact with experts regarding new developments in the field. And it requires you to try and build from hearing to hearing um, what you can to prove the, the very stringent test that is set out in Ontario. So it almost becomes like a, a trial and error. You know, you have one appellant, you call a case, 
they are very limited in the experts that they can provide or are able to engage. And then as you go on to the, the next cases, um, you know, you have to say, okay, let's, let's see what we can find in Europe. Let's see what we can find in, in Australia. Let's see what we can find in, in the United States. Um, and you know, I think that everybody understands that the further away you go from home in respect of trying to retain experts, generally it becomes more expensive, right? It, it becomes a more difficult process and the appellants um, are often, very often seen as having to make a choice between whether or not I'm going to engage an expert or whether or not I'm going to en engage legal counsel. And I think that when you're left with that kind of choice, that's a barrier to justice. That becomes an issue that uh, appellants are not properly able to access the process. So I think going forward, uh, I don't really know that this is something that, um, it's going to have to be something that's fixed through policy. Everything in respect of the, um, you know, renewable energy appro approvals in the province of Ontario is statutorily mandated. It's mandated through um, regulatory uh, regimes. They're, uh, they are very rigid in the time limit restrictions. They very rarely provide adjournments um, for, you know, to marshal proper expert evidence. So given all of that, um, I think that, you know, it's, it is a very real problem for appellants. And one of the questions that was raised in respect of the previous speaker was, you know, we have these kind of um, environmental groups and their ability to participate in the tribunal hearings and doesn't it make it longer and doesn't it make it more um, costly? And I would say from an appellant standpoint, we would quite likely welcome that type of intervention because now you have another party with a deeper understanding of the issues before the tribunal and someone that hopefully you can share the calling of the experts with so that it's, a, it's an avenue to be able to get the kind of expert evidence before the tribunal that an individual appellant may not be able to afford. It's an opportunity to bring evidence before the tribunal that the appellant may not have been able to find given the short timelines. And it's an opportunity for appellants to work with community organizations and groups um, in order to be able to have a really full hearing of all of the issues um, that they would like to raise before the tribunal and may not be able to uh, just due to the kind of time constraints and um, uh, financial constraints. I know that in Ontario there are a lot of appellants who would like to um, bring an appeal on both issues, both the health issue and the environmental issue. And they're left in a position where, well, we can't, we just can't afford you know, eight experts, four in the health field and four in the environmental field. And so they have to make a choice, right? Which do we think we have a better chance of succeeding on? Um, which do we think that the tribunal may, may be more receptive to hearing? Um, which area do we think that the respondent may have uh, less availability to experts in so that it would be more difficult for them to respond to our case? And I think those are a lot of the practical realities that you face when you have an, an independent appellant, a, a regular citizen, that's trying to put forward an environmental case. This is not an, an issue where, um, you know, it's something that the tribunals are going to decide by themselves. These are not issues where the tribunal is going to look at and say, okay, this is common sense and, and I can make a, a judicial decision on this. These are cases where the tribunal has said, we need the assistance of experts in order to understand whether or not you have uh, discharged your burden of proof. And given that, um, you know, it becomes a uphill battle for appellants in order to meaningly participate in these kind of environmental 
review tribunals. So I'm not going to, because it's really a practical approach to the limitations for appellants in, in getting expert evidence, there's not going to be any great cases where, y where you can say, oh, look at this case. They've discussed how expensive it is for an appellant to get an expert, or look at this case that discusses why these timelines are a barrier um, for an appellant to get an expert. A lot of it really comes down to you know, common sense. Um, it comes down to practicality. It comes down to an issue where you, you really are left with a, a fight of, of David and Goliath people with unlimited resources and the ability to marshal a great pool of experts and engage experts very early on in the process and appellants who are um, very often late to the game with limited funds and can only engage experts uh, once an approval holder has been granted their approval. So. I think that I would just turn it over to if there are any questions. Okay. Are, are there any questions from the audience? If, if there are, again, those cards that have, have been um, circulated. And um, if anyone um, watching on the internet um, has a question, feel free to um, send it in. The question is, given the huge number of almost identical REA hearings, could the ERT have been more creative or proactive in facilitating the retainer of experts on health to ensure meaningful access to justice? I think that's a, a really good question. Um, I think that the, the tribunal definitely could have been or can be more proactive in that regard. Um, if you go to a lot of these hearings, especially in Ontario, and from what I've read of some of the hearings in Alberta, in respect of the proponents, you tend to see the same expert giving evidence over and over and over again. Um, and that if there were some kind of pool of experts that the tribunal could put together where even appellants could just uh, you know, contact them to find kind of get some basic information, it would probably be very helpful in the process. I think when you have an, an independent individual who is going to start this kind of appeal process, they're overwhelmed just by, where do I start? Where do I find an expert who's going to talk to me about the bobolink or, uh, you know, or a turtle? Or where do I find an expert that's going to talk to me about health effects from wind turbines? I mean, when I go to my doctor, my family doctor, they give me 15 minutes, and if I can't tell them exactly where it hurts and why it hurts, they're writing me a prescription and I'm, I'm out the door, right? So uh, it would be a good start for people to be able to speak to someone who has some kind of expertise in the field and do that before they begin the appeal process so that they can kind of start to gather and marshal yeah. the evidence that would be required. And, and you'll recall one of the previous, in the previous panel, a question ab about um, governments um, abdicating from the development of science. Um, ironically, here at, at the University of Calgary, for example, and at other universities and um, government scientists um, out there. Is there good research? Because you can't have experts if you don't have good research to, to, um, to lead proper evidence uh, that is scientifically tested and, and understood. Um, so tho those are sort of issues that, that um, pile up, I guess. Um, one, one question that, that came in that is, is related to this is, what about lobbying governments to stipulate that only experts should be called by a tribunal? Or, or maybe as a different spin on that, um, certain tribunals have, I believe the ERT has the power under the legislation to appoint its own experts. Um, have, have either of those, do you think either of those things would be useful solutions? Maybe, maybe start with the only experts question. Well, I think that would be a useful solution if the burden wasn't placed on the appellant. So where you have this burden that the appellant must prove that a project will not cause serious harm to human health or serious or irreversible harm to the environment, I think that then placing that additional requirement that only experts can be called to provide evidence, then you you're definitely will be eliminating a lot of appellants from the ability to bring an appeal that you know the 
the, the government or the legislation says they're permitted to bring. If the, it was that an appellant um, brings an appeal and they say, I think that this project may cause harm and the onus was on uh, an approval holder or the onus was on the government to say, no, this project is safe, then that I think would make a lot of sense. And, and there's one other question that, that came in and I wanna bridge between these two questions because the, the last one about experts, to me the, the answer to this is when you have a hearing, it's not just about the expertise, it's partly also about the facts and the impacts on people's lives. And, and you wanna hear that evidence if you're a tribunal. But more importantly, one of the functions that, that having a hearing serves is to give citizens the right to be heard, the right to come before a tribunal and be told, we don't care. And, and that <laughs> seems to be what happens. And, and, and that leads me to the next question, which is, are some of the issues raised in your presentation a result of the fact that environmental assessment thresholds are too high and thus citizens only have the potential to raise concerns after an approval has been granted? Well, I guess that depends on which side of the issue you work on because <laughs> there will be, uh, you know, in the Ontario process, they say that um, while a, a project is under review, citizens have the ability to raise concerns, write their concerns to the director. How much weight those concerns are given, I, I mean, I don't know. Uh, might, you know, Puff the Magic Dragon might have an answer to that, I have no idea, but um, it's, and citizens in that process feel like they're not being heard, right? I, I've raised concerns, and you get a very kind of generic response from the proponent or the government says, we've reviewed this and we think that this is in the public interest. And a lot of times there's not really an explanation about how the project is in the public interest is required or provided. Um, so in that regard, you know, I think that uh, it's, it's, it's a little difficult because as I said, some people on the other side of the, the debate would say that yes, there's meaningful opportunity to participate um, people on my side of the debate who represent appellants, I would say no. I would say there is not a, a meaningful opportunity to participate prior to the appeal process and that really in Ontario, in respect of the um, uh, renewable energy projects, it's the only opportunity to participate. So once that approval is granted, that's the only route that you can take. Other than that, you know, y you wait for a project to commence and if you can bring a nuisance claim, then you bring a nuisance claim. But that's not necessarily what people are concerned with. People are concerned with potential impacts on their health and that the only way to um, voice those concerns is through the Environmental Review Tribunal process. Um, well, uh, a question has come in about participant funding and, uh, and whether that would be a, a, a good idea. And, and of course, the obvious answer is, of course it would be a good idea. Um, the question really, I guess, let's turn this question around is, who should provide the funding um, is, is a question. And I've heard comments made to, to me by people who do these hearings on behalf of the proponents that sometimes it might actually be helpful for them to, uh, I if there were funding for the opponents, because it would make a hearing go more smoothly and um, would you could tackle the issues right away. Do you think that's something, A, that is practical, B, likely to happen, um, and C, if so, who's gonna, who's gonna pay for it? So, I, in the Ontario Energy Board, I think that's a good example. Although most of their, their things are done through written submissions, I know that people who, or individuals that seek standing, can get some funding from the Ontario Energy Board to pay for legal fees or to pay for disbursements and costs that they have incurred. It may not be the full cost of, of what they have um, incurred in respect of that process, but I do think that it goes a long way uh, to helping um, those individuals participate in the process. The other thing that I think it's helpful for is that when you go out in the community, well, I'm, I'm a farmer, I'm, a, I'm an appellant, and I want some assistance because this project is not only going to affect me, it's going to affect my neighbors, it's gonna affect others in the community. And, um, you know, 
granted anybody in the province of Ontario can, can start an appeal of a renewable energy project, but I'm sure that a wind proponent, the government or the tribunal itself, doesn't want 85 affected landowners coming forward on one project to file 85 separate appeals in respect of the same issue. So I think it would be helpful if, they, if we could have a way where there are some funds that are set aside um, and that appellants could have access to those funds. Maybe the funds can be marked for specific uh, purposes. So there's access to funds and you could have access to those funds for engaging experts. That would be something that I think would go a long way to reducing some of the barriers that appellants face in that tribunal process. Um, the, the question has come in um, that relates back to Adam's presentation, uh, and that is on whether the assessment of standing, do you think, should be done at the beginning or partway through the process? Would that make any difference on, on access to justice issues in these cases? I think, I think the standing issue is something that should be addressed at the beginning of the process. And then um, I think as Adam was saying that as it goes along, you can scope that standing, right? So generally the issue is one, do you have standing? Okay, that's an issue that can be decided at the beginning of the process. Two, the scope of your standing and the scope of what submissions a tribunal or a court is going to be allow um, can be narrowed or focused as the, the process goes along. You, you know, it's, it's often been said that justice delayed is justice denied. Um, the REA hearings are designed for these quick start to finish um, procedures. Uh, do you think that, that a speedy hearing is better than a delayed hearing? Well, I guess I, I think it depends on who benefits from the speedy hearing. Uh, so <laughs> Um, I mean, when you look at it, a speedy hearing, of course, it, it's good for the proponent. Um, and I'm not saying that these hearings should take uh, two or three years or four years as, as we may often see in a regular litigation process. But I do think that, um, you know, it may be that you need a little bit more time on the front end so that people can properly provide expert reports and exchange documents. And then the tribunal can have, from the time the hearing starts to the time a decision is rendered, you can have that kind of expedited process. But I, I, I think at the front end of it, it's a little unrealistic um, to ask people to kind of engage in that process with limited resources and an expedited timetable. How about the EBR register? Does it um, have a lot of information that can be useful for these sort of things? Well, um, in, in, uh, for those not in Ontario, um, there's a requirement imposed on environmental um, bill of rights registry information about a project that's put uh, out there for um, and proponents have to um, put that information up. That, that, that information is definitely helpful, but then you're left with the process of paying for an expert before an approval has been granted. And I just don't think that there are a lot of people who are in a position to say, well, I'm going to spend $10,000 in case an approval is granted, and if they're not, then what do I do? Do I go back to the expert and say, can I have my $10,000 back? That it just doesn't work that way. So although the information may be there, and I can review the information, and I can you know, gather some points about it, the idea of retaining an expert um, in order to kind of meet the time limits, you'd have to do it before the project <coughs> is approved, and I think that that's a barrier for most people. Um, thank you very much, Asha, and, and thanks everyone. Um, not only is justice delayed, justice denied, but a coffee break delayed <laughs> is a happy audience denied. Um, but before we, we move to our coffee break, I wanted to um, thank our sponsors. Um, the, the breakfast we had this morning was sponsored by Denton's, and our upcoming um, coffee break is sponsored by Tories, the Canadian Centre for Environmental Arbitration and Mediation, and um, Davis LLP, legal advisor since 1892, soon to become DLA Piper Canada, um, <laughs> legal advisors since um, either 1892 or 2015. Um, stay, <laughs> stay tuned. Um,